Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. Thank you for joining us today. Uh, welcome to the Feminist AI Research Network Global Webinar Series. This is an, in an initiative led by Women at the Table, Technology Technological Costa Rica in three hubs, Asia led by Suraj Hong Hongladoram and Supavadi Aramwit at, um, in, in Thailand, uh, the Middle East and North Africa, MENA hub led by Nagla Risk at the Access to Knowledge for Development Center at the American University in Cairo, Egypt, and the Latin America and Caribbean hub led by Paula Ricarte of Tech Monterey in Mexico City. We have an incredibly exciting lineup today with presentations of applied research from the FAIR, Feminist AI Research Network, through its incubating Feminist AI from paper to prototype to pilot project funded by IDRC and CEDA. Incubating Feminist AI focuses on feminist approaches to artificial intelligence, which are harnessed to deliver equality outcomes designed with inclusion at the core in order to create new opportunities and innovative correction of inequities. Um, these applied research papers focus on proactive problem solving, springboarding from the why and the what to research on how new AI and ADM data, algorithms, models, networks, policies, or systems can concretely and positively impact social problems, improve quality of life, and correct for historic exclusion. The three regional hubs and our global network further engage with and connect researchers, academics, and practitioners with perspectives from both the global south and north to deepen these definitions and directions for a feminist AI, explore current and emerging questions associated with AI from a feminist point of view, and develop a research agenda for our ongoing feminist AI research network. So today's very exciting topic is feminist AI from the majority world, new thinking, new systems, where we'll be hearing from the researchers in our third cohort of grantees with their groundbreaking projects ranging from Asia to MENA to LAC, We'll hear each from each project for approximately seven minutes, have a short follow-up question, um, and then we will have, uh, after the presentations, we'll have a panel discussion. So we're particularly thrilled to convene colleagues from Indonesia, Egypt, India, Mexico, Ecuador, and Chile, all in one webinar, ranging from very late at night to very early in the morning, and we so appreciate you all being here. We welcome questions and comments in the Q&A section of the webinar or in the chat, and we look forward to hearing your reactions, your thoughts, and your comments. Just as a note, we have Spanish translation, and we will have two segments of the panel in Spanish. So um, we will direct you to go to the, the English channel at that point, um, and that, that will come as we go along. So uh, very excited to have everybody here. Uh, thank you so much for joining us. And we would like to welcome our first team, which is um, the Child Marriage in Indonesia team with their exploration of AI and a digital public good for gender justice. So we would like to welcome Jaime Juan Fatoni, who is a legal analytics consultant with Australia-Indonesia Partnership for Justice, and Mohamed Riandaru Daniswaro, a researcher, a researcher at Research Center for Law, Gender and Society of Faculty of Law, Universitas Gajah Mada. Thank you so much for coming, and uh, we look forward to hearing your presentation. Okay, thank you, Mitchell, for that introduction. Um, I guess we're the first here because it's quite late here in Indonesia. It's uh, almost 10 p.m., but it's fine. We're going to keep spirited. Okay, so uh, uh, as Mitchell has said before, my name is Daru, and I'm from a, res I'm a researcher from a recent center for law, gender, and society, Universitas Gajah Mada, Indonesia, and together I'm with with Mr. Jaime Wan Fatoni, who is a legal data analytics consultant for Australian Indonesian Partnership for Justice. So we're here to discuss our research findings, uh, which we titled Incubating Evidence-Based Approaches in Preventing Child Marriage in Indonesia. So these are the writers, as you can see, uh, it's, a, it's a huge team on our part. So this project is a collaboration between three entities, which is the research center, which I am part of, Second, uh, the AIPJ, uh, which is part, Iwan is part of. And then I think the most valuable partner is PECA, PECA Foundation. Unfortunately, Ms. Vila from PECA could not attend today. But PECA is a NGO that focuses on women who are head of families in Indonesia. And their membership is across Indonesia, 85,000 members, quite a lot. And uh, some of them has engaged in training with PECA 
uh, as a form of empowerment. So we've made uh, progress in terms of these women um, have become pillars in their community. Uh, the program of PECA Foundation includes uh, health empowerment. So we trained um, health experts on community level. There's legal training. So we established paralegals and then uh, political training and also economic training. Um, PECA holds a really important part in our project because uh, the idea came from them and uh, they will be the one that help us the most in implementing our project. So in regards to the issue itself, we are talking about child marriage in Indonesia. So child marriage in Indonesia is a contested issue. Uh, its legality has been debated by some. Uh, we are under the position that it is a violation of women's rights. Um, however, the government seems to put in place a mechanism to legalize child marriage. So child marriage is legal to, to an extent if it is done through a request through the religious court. However, based on our research from a grassroots level, we always encounter child marriages that are not requested through court. They are done in silence and using religious means only. Now, this phenomenon resulted in two things. First is that they are not recognized by the government, meaning that they do not enjoy the protection and they are unable to access facilities uh, that are accessible to uh, the regist registered couples. And this would create further issue, for example, in relation to children who are born within such marriage. There might be issue in relation to whether that child is quote unquote legitimate under Indonesian law. The second is the fact that they are not recognized mean that they are invisible to the government. The government official data on child marriage only relies on the data that is provided by the religious court, meaning that if a, ch a child marriage is not conducted through religious court, it is not under uh, Indonesian government official data. Based on our estimation, there are around 240,000 girls that were married and unregistered because most of the child marriages are not in uh, registered under uh, through the religious court. This is most stark in one of the cases that we found in one province where one of the governments said that child marriages is not a big issue here because the number is really low. What they do not know is they say it's low because the number that child marriage through the court is low. But because of our research, we found that it's low not because there's no child marriage. It's because the religious uh, nature of the community make them believe that religion-based marriage is the one that's valid, that they do not need the, reg uh, the marriage to be registered. So this is an issue because the lack of their data would first render the government uh, they don't care. They don't believe that there is an issue. So there is no awareness at all. But secondly, if there is no data, the government will not be able to create appropriate intervention. They may rely on stereotypes, for example, putting on curfews because they believe that women going out at night increases the chance of them engaging in something that they do not want, which is, again, based on stereotype. And that's dangerous. So the key here is that we need to have data on these marriages that are done not through the court, but done in silence and usually on the village level. So what we wanted to do is to give voices to these 240 child brides who are now invisible to the government. And second, the data we believe would, be, would allow women's movement and CSOs in Indonesia to advocate better, to raise awareness that this is an issue. The third is we liaised with various government institutions and they believe that they need this data in order to do something. Because as of now, their data is really limited. And they believe that they, it's, not, it's, not, um, it's not feasible to create an intervention if there is no data to it. The fourth is that the PECA paralegals, the, the, the members of the uh, NGO that I mentioned that is collaborated in this, in this project, we would empower them to adopt the feminist methodology to understand the experiences of the parents of the child brides and the child brides themselves. So, uh, like I said, I am presenting this with Pa Iwan, I'm Iwan Zifatoni, and he will be the one that uh, explained the, the technical aspect of this project. Pa Iwan, I give it to you. 
Thank you. Thank you, uh, Daru. So um, what we are going to do is basically the uh, two states of uh, activity, two states of prototyping activity. The first stage is uh, aim to facilitate the uh, data exchange, the data transmission between uh, our power legals at the village level uh, and uh, the PK central headquarter to uh, disseminate the data that, that will be used to influence the policy. And the second activity, uh, after we have the data, then uh, we will uh, employ a couple of uh, approach to and, and pattern recognition, correlation analysis, things like that. Uh, to cover some uh, insights. And it will combine with various data from uh, both uh, official and, and non-official data sources. Can we go to the next slide, uh, Mas Daru? Probably. Mas Daru, can you? Yeah. Okay. So uh, we will use uh, the technology, of course, to, to collect the data. Uh, basically, it is uh, applying a basic data analytics approaches to to collect the data and then uncover some insights uh, from textual sources from the unstructured data because we will provide the facility for uh, the paralegals to input their uh, observation uh, and then it need to be uh, extracted it's basically in a free text so it, it will employ a couple of text mining algorithm for that and uh, it will also provide an alternative approach to observe what happened in the field that's often missing because uh, usually the, the classical data input will base on a predetermined, predetermined field, uh, which uh, sometimes lost in the uh, richness and and the variation in, in uh, what happened in the field. Uh, next slide, Masteru. Okay, so this is a, a simplified diagram uh, uh, of what uh, we are going to do. So it will be a three layers uh, system. First is the uh, data collection or data ingestion system, and then it will be processed, and then it will be uh, presented to the users. Uh, we will have uh, basically, like I said before, two types of data. One is uh, structured, it's mainly statistical data from uh, relevant government agencies. In terms of the file format, usually uh, we can uh, extract or ask or download in a comma separated format. Uh, and then we, we need, it need to be converted because uh, some maybe not, and then put it as as a kind of a database for further processing. And uh, for field observation data, uh, we will have some kind of, uh, we call it a smart receiver and, and data loader uh, in order to enable the input. Uh, it will be started with a simple text input, but if possible, we will, uh, examine the possibility to use the speech to text algorithm so it will be easier for uh, the paralegals to input data they just can uh, speak and probably it will be guided uh, in some kind of chatbot form in order to have the key critical data again and will be uh, put in the database and we will apply uh, the a part we will apply the a couple of uh, nlp algorithm text mining algorithm to extract the result and put it in a JSON format. And will be uh, cross-related, cross-analyzed with uh, the statistical data in order to get the input. Uh, to give the illustration, for example, is uh, uh, we want to convince uh, uh, the family that want to apply for a child marriage exemption that it will be bad because of the uh, health uh, impact, like a stunting, for example. We need the data, official data on stunting and we need to combine it with uh, whatever input that the field paralegals uh, use related to the uh, health issue. And uh, there will be a couple of data maps related to specific topic, and that will be extracted and and then later on uh, presented to the users. Next, Mas Daru. Okay, so we are going to implement it just in one area. It's called Cianjur, West Java, Indonesia. It is only about a uh, hundred kilometers from the capital Jakarta, and it has the highest number of child marriage in Indonesia, accounted around uh, twenty percent of of the child marriage that happen nationwide, and uh, it is close actually uh, from uh, the capital. So it is a interesting place to to uh, experiment with because uh, we will have uh, quite uh, significant uh, data in terms of the the population uh, of the child marriage. 
next Mbak Sudami. Oke, okay. thank you. That's all from us. Thank you so much uh, for your presentation. Uh, I think it's very illuminating to see the work that you're doing and the impact that it'll have on on so many young people's lives. Uh, I'm I'm curious to know. There's so many moving parts to this project. There's so many people that you have to engage. You have to bring them on board. They have to be, you know, convinced. There has to be a lot of uh, digital literacy involved. So how how was the community engagement um, and the longstanding collaboration with uh, with Pekka and your community partners? How was that handled? Okay, thank you, Mitchell, for that question. Uh, Paiwan, I'll I'll take that question if you don't mind, and feel free to add if you have any. Um, so this project, uh, our design, this idea was discussed with uh not only the coordinators of this, uh, of Pekka, but also the paralegals of Pekka that existed in villages. So in this research, we asked them. Uh, our first uh priority in this research was asking the level of di the digital literacy, because we were firstly skeptical on whether they will be able to uh, uh, take benefit from the technology. However, we see that they already have enough digital literacy. Of course, it varies between uh, uh, between individuals and between areas. However, in, 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 in general, they do have uh, a significant digital literacy, so we believe that they will be able to take uh, benefit from this proposed technology. Uh, secondly, even after we have provided this with their technology, of course, consultation with them in relation to the design and everything, the functionality, we will also train them because every time, so our collaboration with Poka has been going on for years. We've already conducted research on divorces, on the role of paralegals in women access to justice. What they always want when we do research is capacity building for them. They always, they enjoy the, the learning process. So they have practical skill to, to, to solve issue in in their in their surroundings. So when we bring this issue, they are curious on how or how to act when they receive, how to act properly when they receive uh, information in regarding to child marriages. In reality, they have been engaged. Uh, with, uh, they've been engaged by parents who want to engage in child marriages because as I said before, they become a public figure. They are paralegals, they are health expert, they are uh, entrepreneurs, they are even political part of the village governance. So they're, the first responder in 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 this issue, they want to know how do we act properly when this happens. So after we will provide them with the technology, we will engage in training with them on how to do this uh, appropriately, what to ask, and how to ask it in a way that wouldn't create conflict within community. So we will definitely not only for our benefit, but we will also engage them on how it's best to use this proposed technology. In addition to that, we believe that the data that will be acquired from this initiative will give them better position to advocate the issue. One of the, so in, in, within PECA, there are uh, 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 some kind of division. There are the health division, the health experts, the legal experts, but there's also the political experts, the political headers, the, the, the one that is active in, in village governance. Now, those part would benefit in having data in relating to child marriages. We believe that these women who are head of families, but also very active politically in their village would use this data to better advocate in, related, in relation to child marriages. But in, in general, we believe that all of this initiative would ultimately empower these women because before PACA trainings, before before we engage with them, they are a head of family, meaning that they are they engage they they went through divorces, they were left by their husbands, they were uh, their husband died before them, and they were stigmatized by the society, meaning that they are underestimated. There are a, a certain stigma attached to women in villages when they are no longer have husbands due to 
uh, divorce or, or, or uh, various things. However, with these trainings, with these initiatives, they become more active, they become outspoken, and they become important public figures. So we believe that this initiative would strengthen their position while at the same time would, would strengthen our collaboration from the uh, Australian Inter uh, and Indonesian Partnership for Justin and also us from the academia. Um, uh, uh, so it will strengthen uh, our collaboration with Pekka. So I think that that's from me, Mitchell, thank you. Thank you so much. Um, and again, thank you so much for the presentation. I think there's so, there's, I mean, these fields of research are so crucial um, in so many different areas of life and to so many different groups of people. And I think um, being able to include people who also need that uh, digital literacy is is a really wonderful thing. Um, next, we move to our colleagues in India uh, with reimagining automated violence intervention through a participatory technology design. Uh, so this project contends with what a participatory approach to building AI tools to support crisis intervention might look like, and specifically in the case of technology facilitated gender-based violence. So the research team looked at TechSafi, a digital helpline, its callers and the user journey to develop possible interventions involving first line responders in the ideation phase. The team consists of Padmini Ray Murray from Design Beku, a collective which emerged uh, from the team's desire to explore how technology and design can be decolonial, local, and ethical. Sasha John from Digital Futures Lab, a multidisciplinary research network that examines the complex interactions between technology and society in the global south and Shahini Banerjee from Point of View, an organization with a vision to create a gender just world online. So thank you so much. Uh, and uh, we welcome Shahini uh, to present uh, alongside, <clears throat> sorry, alongside Padmini. Okay. Um, hi everyone. Sorry, I hope you can see my slides and um very happy to be here and be part of this cohort and you know hear all the different presentations um this project was a partnership as uh, mitchell mentioned with design beku coming in with expertise um in technology design digital futures lab a research organization um including experience in uh, ai and point of view um, so I'm from Point of View, my name is Shohini, and we've been working with uh, communities, women, uh, girls, and sexual minorities in the intersection of sexuality, gender, and technology. Um, so we started with the context that, you know, India has uh, the fastest growing users of technological device, um, but there is a gender, digi uh, there's a digital gender divide. Um, and to one of the structural barriers for that is uh, the violence that's faced by women and girls online. Um, furthermore, 40% of um, women are less likely to own mobile phones and 33% are less likely um, than men to use mobile internet. Um, one in five women in India receive sexual harassment or inappropriate calls or face other forms of technology facilitated gender-based violence, which can include anything from, say, uh, harassing messages um, to non-consensual sharing of intimate images, doxing or the sharing of one's personal information, including their address. Um, and what this does is the impact is multiple fold. Uh, at an individual level, it means uh, there's Im uh, impact to psychosocial well being. Um, there are often physical uh, uh, effects related to technology facilitated gender based violence. Um, it, in the context of our work, it also, we look at it as uh, reducing digital participation for two reasons. One, it leads to many women to self censor or not participate online um, as a response to facing violence. On the other hand, there's also protectionist responses from male uh, gatekeepers in society or um, systems which will say things like, you know, you shouldn't post photos online. All of that leads to reduction in digital participation. So we wanted to kind of, um, that's one of the reasons we work on addressing technology, technology facilitated gender-based violence. 
there are um, mechanisms of addressing it from the state uh, in the form of legal responses or platforms in the form of community guidelines um, and content moderation. There are also uh, several civil society initiatives and some use technology, but often um, in our initial findings, we saw that um, they're used for uh, offline violence. Um, some have used automated inf interventions um, or artificial intelligence, um, for example, for large data analysis or used it in chatbots to provide response service. Um, but we were also looking at what other types of um, intelligent or automated interventions could there be. Um, oftentimes, you know, machine learning presupposes um, a particular type of intelligence, um, which in many ways might be um, antithetical to the values of feminism. Uh, and it rests on individualistic rather than a relational view of um, social life. Uh, so it, in a way, it's often, it's almost like um, computational statistics um, and, com and information compression. So we wanted to see whether there was another way which we could situate um, this project within an existing community of people who are facing technology facilitated gender based violence and um, create processes through participatory tech technology design um, where we can collaborate collaboratively um, co create a type of artificial intelligence that could provide meaningful full support to technology facilitated um, response. Um, we we ended up um, while we envisioned it as a, 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 we started with thinking about a community um, we decided to narrow our focus to one particular response which is tech Saki, um, an initiative by point of view which is a digital informational helpline on um, digital safety and security and i'll go into why we kind of focused um, on that but the questions that we were trying to uh, answer were, um, we started with looking at what are some of the pain points or bottlenecks that arise um, where, for uh, survivor responses um, or like people who face violence um, and particularly we're looking at women and girls. Um, what type of pain points do they face or what type of pain points do uh response providers face um when supporting uh survivors of violence um we were also looking at what are the possible um ai interventions that could support and complement uh the human touch points and not necessarily override the process um and lastly kind of getting uh responder feedback um on how AI can be introduced to make the process of uh, violence response more effective. We, in terms of our methodology, um, after conducting initial uh, literature review and looking at um, other forms and response mechanisms that exists, um, we wanted to conduct participatory workshops to explore issues of violence, gaps in service delivery, and the possible use of automation. But due to a number of um, challenges, including limited time, differences of understanding of AI, um, as well as conversations with um, you know, experts and practitioners working on technology and participatory approaches, we decided to kind of focus on um, the one specific response. And instead of um, kind of looking at uh, the user of the response, we start, we looked at the, um, the service provider. 
we conducted two focus group discussions with our, the tech security responders and supported that with the analysis or in-depth analysis of calls to understand the user journey um, and again to understand the human touch points and um, where technology, specifically AI, can provide support. So what we found um, was that we used a service design approach to first map the caller journey um, and identify the pain points. Um, we found that there were structural pain points which could have a potential AI solution, um, but some things like uh, assessment or empathy, AI could not replace due to var various um, limitations. And just in a user journey, if I can simplify it, um, there is a, a pre pre call stage um, where the user is reaching out to this service, um, the assessment stage to understand the nature of the problem, the actual engagement and information dissemination, and then post call. Um, and what we found interestingly was that um, Whereas often uh, there are many uh, uh, interventions that post initial um, automated engagement and assessment, then it's connected to a human uh, responder. We found that at the assessment stage, it was crucial for a, a human intervention to be there. And in fact, it was um, after the stage that uh, the the that and various pain points that exist existed that potential AI solutions could come in. Um, some of the ones that we were looking at were, um, for example, AI image reading software. So oftentimes, callers at the assessment stage, uh, we're finding it difficult to explain the nature of the problem. Due, while there is rapid digitalization in India, the there is a variety of um, digital skills. There are new digital users and the proficiency with which it's required to do a technical assist, uh, assessment might not necessarily be there. So we imagined um, an AI image reading software um, and a variation of this could be uh, to allow the user to send screenshots instead of live um, sharing, because there's also an, uh, issues of low connectivity and things like that. Um, and, while, and then AI redacting sensitive data. Um, other pain points that we found were, uh, again, due to the nature of the callers, um, there was a requirement of uh, being unable to hear and therefore assess. Um, often for those facing violence, there is a need for uh, crisis intervention and empathy um, and a first aid, psychological um, first aid, if you will. Um, and that required uh, a, an a, an environment that's safe and um, quiet. Uh, so we imagine possibly there could be noise cancelling AI technologies to distinguish between human voice and background voice and amplify the human voice. And lastly, to uh, reduce the burden of four responders, we imagined a AI powered search um, to elevate the current functionality uh, so that at the back end responders could be more effective in uh, providing support. So um, we it's still at the initial stage and obviously we are um, at the process of uh, identifying um, possi possible solutions, but we hope to uh, take it forward from here. Thank you so much. Um, I think that's, it's so interesting how um, figuring out how to use a tool like this requires uh, really a process of trust um, and considering that you're working uh, with survivors of technology facilitated gender based violence. Um, so, within that vein, um, you mentioned that you began the project um, anticipating an AI solution 
for the survivors of technology can facilitate gender-based violence, but through your process, you realize that AI should be used judiciously. So um, can you unpack that a bit and um, re reiterate what you think the, the replicable lessons might be for others struggling with how to best provide these services? Sure. Um, so I'll, uh, I think there were there are two main things that I want to highlight in that. And um, it was quite interesting. We struggled quite in the beginning to really um, define what participatory uh, technology design, design looks like, and really who the uh, question who the participants in this uh, design process are. Um, and it required us to shift from the usual service design model that prioritize the customer or user. And in this case, it was survivors of violence um, in favor of responders um, and looking at their needs, which then informed the type of um, and the kinds of possible uh, AI interventions that we explored. Um, so one of this was because, uh, you know, participatory design um, of this kind required a basic uh, understanding of the capabilities of AI. And we, due to our limited time frame as well as the limited time frame of responders, we were not able to do that in a meaningful way. Um, so we tried to instead be pivoted to understand their needs from uh, the series of focus group discussions. Um, the other uh, the other factor that kind of contributed to this was um, looking at the type of response mechanism um, and the type of survivors. Um, in this case, Texaki and uh, the survivors who were calling in, um, one, were at a crisis level, and two, uh, required support in even assessment of the nature of their problem. and. Therefore, um, we had to acknowledge for that and pivot to uh, identify solutions that made sense in that particular context. Um, so, yeah. Padmini, if you wanted to just, uh, from Padmini from our team is also here, but, and if you wanted to contribute to anything, please feel free. But otherwise, back to you, Michelle. No, I'm good. Thank you very much, Shohini. All right. Thank you so much, Padmini, and thank you, Shohini, as well. Uh, so we will move uh, to Latin America. Uh, we wanted to, we'd like to present uh, community perspectives of AI in natural resource governance for Technicas Rudas, and Mayeli Sanchez Martinez will be presenting. Um, at this point, we'd like to note that Mayeli will be giving uh, her presentation in Spanish. Therefore, uh, if you could kindly on your menu, switch to the English language channel, you should be able to see that if you click on the globe icon and you'll see that you can listen in to English or Spanish. So please click in and uh, listen to the English interpretation. Thank you so much, Mayeli. Gracias. Buenos días, buenas tardes, buenas noches a en donde se encuentren. En el proyecto que voy a presentar se llama Perspectivas Comunitarias de la Inteligencia Artificial en la Gobernanza de los Recursos Naturales. No sé si me pudieran confirmar por el chat que se está escuchando y entendiendo bien, porque um, creo que no puedo ver bien. Um, entonces... Uh, Este proyecto nace ante la necesidad de poder pensar cómo actualmente existe una disputa entre diferentes formas de ver la vida y de habitar este planeta, en particular pensando que existe una visión que es bastante colonialista, que es una visión que se intenta imponer a otras formas de vida, en donde lo que se pretende es la dominación de la naturaleza, y esto incluyendo la dominación de otros seres humanos, de otros no solamente de otras formas de vida. Eh, y en este sentido eh, se contrapone con otras formas de vida que son diversas y en las cuales no están basadas en la explotación y la dominación. 
En particular vemos que desde muchas formas de pensarse en la tierra eh, por parte de los pueblos originarios, también llamados pueblos indígenas, eh, la forma de habitar este planeta pues tiene que ver con un, un entendimiento de cómo estamos, como toda la materia está en flujo y entonces pertenecemos también a, a este ecosistema, ¿no? Somos parte de, no estamos aquí para dominar. Sin embargo, en estas formas de disputa, pues que no han sido amables, ha habido una serie de mecanismos eh, como para poder, por un lado, someter a las comunidades y por otro lado, la lucha de las comunidades para no ser sometidas. Así, en algunos lugares estas luchas han tomado formas entre estados, entre gobiernos y pueblos originarios para ver cómo se gestionan los recursos naturales, especialmente porque los pueblos originarios son los que se encuentran directamente en posición de los territorios. Así que ha habido toda una serie de diálogos, de, de proyectos, de generación de acuerdos internacionales para pensar la gobernanza de los recursos naturales. En este sentido, en Técnicas Rudas tuvimos un proyecto anterior en el cual nos preguntábamos cuáles eran los mejores indicadores para pensar que se estaba, viendo, se estaba haciendo una buena gestión de los recursos naturales. Y lo que nos dimos cuenta es que para las comunidades y especialmente para las mujeres de las comunidades, los indicadores de la buena gobernanza son totalmente diferentes que los que tienen eh, los estados. Por ejemplo, para un estado, un indicador de, gobernan de buena gobernanza podría ser cuántas concesiones mineras se estaban abriendo y cómo esto afectaba a la economía. Mientras que para las mujeres, un indicador era cómo era la salud de la comunidad en relación a cómo se estaban gestionando los recursos. Entonces, con esto en mente, un poco lo que nos preguntábamos es ¿Qué oportunidad tiene la inteligencia artificial de poder contribuir en las comunidades a la gobernanza de los recursos naturales? Eh, para este proyecto, entonces, nos situamos en una región del norte del país, de México, que se llama Sonora. Es una región muy particular porque tiene un, es un amplio territorio, sin embargo, mucho de este territorio está concesionado para la industria minera. Y, de hecho, esta industria ha causado ya bastantes desastres naturales, como por ejemplo lo que ocurrió en el río Sonora, en donde 273 kilómetros de río fueron contaminados por una minera eh, que extrae cobre. Sin embargo, en este lugar también se han encontrado grandes yacimientos de litio, así que pensamos que la explotación podría ser mayor. Aquí en el mapa, todo lo que ven en amarillo es el territorio que ya ha sido concesionado, no significa que ya estén en, en explotación, pero sí que ya ha sido concesionado a la minería. Y en este territorio hay diferentes pueblos originarios, entre ellos están las tribus yaquis. Estas tribus yaquis habitan en la parte eh, sur del estado de Sonora. Y aquí teníamos un trabajo con la escuela Cehuatónteme y la radio comunitaria eh, Radio Namacasia. Así que les propusimos este proyecto para pensar cómo podría ser una inteligencia artificial que pudiera contribuir a que la comunidad hiciera una gestión de sus recursos naturales, pero en el fondo también cómo podría ser a partir de esta una mejor defensa del territorio, ¿no? cómo le podría contribuir a eso. Como contexto, esta, en este lugar hay una gran necesidad de agua, el agua se puso en varias presas, especialmente para la industria y la minería y también para grandes ciudades y se les ha despojado a los pueblos de aquí por años. Recientemente se está haciendo la construcción de una presa que se supone proveerá agua a las tribus yaquis, sin embargo las tribus desconocen cómo es el proyecto. Y por otro lado también existe un grave problema por el crimen organizado que ha entrado a la comunidad y ha generado una gran cantidad de violencia. La forma en la que hicimos este trabajo pues partió de escuchar a la comunidad, de poder pensar cómo se dialogar con ellas y ellos y ellas, cómo se entiende la gobernanza de los recursos naturales, cómo se entiende el agua desde ellos y ellas, especialmente con jóvenes, con mujeres. Así que hicimos bastantes talleres en campo. Después esta información se pasó a una etapa de procesamiento en el cual se utilizaron diferentes herramientas de inteligencia artificial y, y estadística, se hizo un análisis y se, eh, en, se tuvieron algunos hallazgos. 
Dentro de los talleres que se hicieron, eh, listamos cinco que partían desde el poder pensar cómo ha cambiado la comunidad hasta el que generaran una canción para poder narrar su comunidad. Pues los talleres fueron eh, muy impresionantes, muy bonitos. Fue un equipo de técnicas rudas a trabajar allá con, con las personas de la tribu eh, y a visitar también el territorio y visitar cómo... Eh, el río, que antes era un río que, en el cual se llevaban a cabo ceremonias, pues actualmente es un río que ha sido desaparecido, ¿no? Y ahora la comunidad tiene que llevar eh, pipas, eh, pipas son estos contenedores de agua, para poder hacer su ritual. A partir de todo lo que se trabajó, de las encuestas que se hicieron, de los dibujos que hicieron los, los niños, las niñas, de las canciones que se crearon, pues se pasó a una etapa de sistematización. Y después a una etapa de análisis. En esta parte voy a ir rápido porque no tenemos tanto tiempo, pero quisiera concentrarme como en algunos de los hallazgos que han sido interesantes. Por ejemplo, encontramos que eh, en todas las casas había agua. Y esto podría uno pensar que es un indicador de una buena gestión del agua, ¿no? ¿Por qué? Porque en la mayor parte de los lugares en donde las formas de gobierno son las que llevan el agua a las casas, pues tú podrías pensar que el gobierno está logrando cubrir las necesidades del agua. Sin embargo, en este lugar el, el agua puede llegar hasta cada casa porque la comunidad tiene una comisión del agua que se encargó de generar tuberías y distribuir todo el agua para que pudiera llegar a casa de las personas. Así que toda la comunidad tiene agua, pero eh, está, está restringida y solamente ha sido posible a través del esfuerzo comunitario. Eh, dentro de las imágenes también ha sido muy bonito ver cómo para las, los compañeros y las compañeras de la tribu, pues el, el cambio en la comunidad ha transicionado de estar en una en un territorio rico en agua, a un territorio en el cual el agua se ha perdido. Eh, entonces, aquí, en esta colaboración que tuvimos con Diversa, pues se generaron, a partir de las, de las imágenes que compartieron las infancias, una visualización de cómo era la comunidad antes, que además a la hora de ver las imágenes, pues coincide totalmente, ¿no? Y cómo ha cambiado el territorio, a lo que es actualmente estas comunidades que además están sirviendo de paso para que la mercancía llegue de México a Estados Unidos. En el caso del de uso de imágenes satelitales para poder determinar cuánta agua hay y cómo se distribuye, pues lo que encontramos es que las imágenes satelitales son una herramienta muy importante, sin embargo, necesitamos poder eh, contar con más datos como para que esto pueda empezar a ayudar a la comunidad de forma más predictiva. Eh, finalmente, ¿qué es lo que encontramos? Encontramos que la inteligencia, que encontramos que las comunidades estaban muy interesadas por poder entender y usar la inteligencia artificial, que tienen una gran apertura, sin embargo, tienen muchas dudas de cómo funcionaría esto. Encontramos también que cuando trabajamos en proyectos indisciplinados, es decir, la mayor parte de las veces trabajamos en proyectos multidisciplinarios, en donde cada persona aporta desde su disciplina, desde lo que ha estudiado. Sin embargo, esto representa una fragmentación del conocimiento. Así que cuando pensamos, nos mmm, empezamos a dejar ese lugar cómodo de la disciplina y empezamos a intentar hacer con otras y otros desde la indisciplina, podemos tener eh, formas de intercambio del de conocimiento mucho más lúdicas y profundas. También eh, pensamos que el conocimiento es algo que las comunidades producen y que fácilmente en la medida en la cual la inteligencia artificial pueda ser una herramienta que eh, ellos entiendan, pues van a poder hacer un mejor uso de esta para poder lograr una defensa del territorio y eventualmente sí contribuir a la gobernanza de los recursos que tienen. Y con esto concluiría la presentación. Thank you so much uh, for your presentation and thank you for um, letting us know about this crucial resource that we need to find better ways to manage and 
uh, better ways to <clears throat> to engage with different communities. Uh, I have a brief question. I'm very um, considerate of, of your time. Uh, I, I wonder because of the relationship that um, the technical students has with the community um, and because that's been a profound part of this project's co-creation, how long have you been collaborating with this community and how and what do you think the next steps of, of this project can be? What do you envision for the future? Muchas gracias por la pregunta. Eh, el trabajo que hemos tenido con las comunidades ha sido una larga coincidencia de años en diferentes aspectos. Debido a que en técnicas rudas no solamente nos dedicamos a hacer investigación, sino trabajamos otros aspectos de tecnología. Entonces hemos ido a trabajar, eh, por ejemplo, como eh, con la radio comunitaria, con seguridad digital, con jóvenes para pensar cómo pueden hacer uso de eh, sistemas como los Raspberry Pi. Entonces habíamos tenido ya bastante trabajo con la comunidad en, en una aproximación que buscamos respetuosa desde las necesidades que tienen y sus tiempos, y siempre tratando de que sea su palabra, nunca, nunca, nunca hablar por ellos y ellas, porque para, para eso ellos y ellas tienen su propia voz y eso es lo que hay que potenciar, sino siempre intentando desde esta perspectiva de la colaboración y la escucha. Entonces creo que eso ha sido una cosa importante. Eh, en cualquier caso, las comunidades, aún así, cada vez que presentas un proyecto lo evalúan, no es que porque existe un vínculo de confianza, entonces ya cualquier proyecto que se proponga va a ser aceptado. No, las comunidades son sabias, tienden a hacer una escucha de qué es lo que estás proponiendo y entonces decidir, ¿no? Y en este caso de la inteligencia artificial, lo que notamos durante el proyecto es que efectivamente estaban eh, interesados en conocer, pero con reservas sobre si al final eso no es una herramienta que van a utilizar. Entonces, creo que eso llevará todavía un poco más de tiempo. ¿Y qué nos gustaría hacer a futuro? Nos gustaría mucho poder regresar con la comunidad, porque en esta fase del proyecto hemos concluido la investigación, pero no hemos podido regresar a presentarla con la comunidad. Y hemos dejado abiertas varias, varias líneas de trabajo. En particular, poder entender, eh, mejorar el modelo con más datos, de tal manera que pueda empezar ya a serle útil a la comunidad. Por otro lado, también en profundizar el entendimiento eh, que nosotras tenemos sobre cómo la comunidad percibe a el agua y su importancia dentro de toda su vida, como para que también los modelos puedan eh, reflejar esto, ¿no? para que no solamente sea eh, una especie de traducción, sino que por el contrario eh, sea un cambio de perspectiva. Entonces, básicamente lo que, lo que nosotras quisiéramos es poder continuar con la investigación de forma que podamos pasar más tiempo dentro del territorio con la tribu Yaqui. Thank you so much and thank you Mayuli for the incredible presentation um, and thank you to Veronica for the translation. So uh, we will move to the MENA region now. Uh, good afternoon to our colleagues in the MENA region. Um, so from Egypt, we will discuss explainable AI-based tutoring system for Upper Egypt Community Schools, which will be presented by Marwa Soudi, a self-described serial social mompreneur with more than 15 years of experience in the edtech industry. She's currently a junior researcher of digital transformation and lifelong learning at Tallinn University and PhD student at Tallinn University with a focus on responsible AI and how to build a trustworthy AI ecosystem for SMEs. So very excited to have you here, Marwa. Hi, uh, I'm very excited too. Just one second. So do you see my screen now? Yes, I can see. Okay, so uh, thank you, Mitchell, for the introduction. Uh, today, um, I'm, um, um, I'm excited to be with you and to present uh, our project uh, for community schools in Egypt. Uh, community schools on the, are unprivileged uh, schools in in. Uh, in Egypt, uh, the students there uh, don't have any chance to uh, didn't have any chance to uh, to attend the the normal uh, edu uh, education system in in Egypt. So, 
uh, the community schools are like uh, one classroom in which uh, you can find the students between age uh, like 10 years old and 12 years old studying all together or uh, uh, up to 15 years uh, from 10 to 15 years old studying all together. Uh, I'm going to present now uh, to start the presentation just one second. So here we started our journey uh, for building uh, this tutoring system. Uh, and I am thankful for uh, the A2K4D from Egypt and the A-plus Alliance and everyone who supported this uh, project. So uh, we wanted to use the human-centered AI-based uh, approaches uh, to, to start this uh, project. And uh, what do we mean by human-centered AI approach is to see uh, in, in the natural environment of our uh, target uh, audience here, either the students and teachers, how things are going on and what are the real needs, and instead of just assuming a solution uh, for them or uh, proposing, uh, like uh, coming up like a parachute uh, from a top down approach from our side. So uh, I had a, a, the privilege to go to Asyut uh, a com uh, and visit community school, a community school there. And you can see me here. I just blurred the, the faces of the students for their privacy. And uh, it was a very, very, very hot day. This is something I need to mention. And uh, we went together uh, with the students and teachers to see how uh, things are going and what are their expectations. So uh, that was the start. What are they do expecting from a tutoring system? And here are our findings briefly that uh, the teachers are looking for ready-made content with the ability to customize the content. Uh, the content they needed to be entertaining uh, and uh, with questions for practice. And uh, they want the reports coming out of uh, the learning management system or from the torturing system to be explainable, uh, containing visuals, uh, having the students' reports, explaining uh, the, in details uh, the progress of each student and their performances. <clears throat> So we came up with a the following proposed solution, which is to build the AI based the torturing system. And uh, our proposed torturing system is composed of three blocks. The first block is concerned with the with the content. Sorry, there is uh, my network sometimes is slow. Uh, the first block is related to the content generation, and uh, for us, the content is divided into two things. The the what the students are going to see, uh, this interactive content that the teachers uh, ask it for, which is should be edutaining, should contain some like visuals, uh, videos, interactive animation, uh, something that uh, attracts the student attention. So that what do they mean by content? And the questions that the students uh, are going to, uh, to practice uh, a concept uh, after watching this uh, piece of video uh, playing this inter or this visual uh, after watching those visuals uh, so they practice a concept so the students what the, the teachers want is an interactive visual uh, visuals explaining a certain concept for example explaining division or fraction in mathematics then a group of questions in which the students can uh, practice um, it's worth mentioning that uh, we did a lot of, uh, of background research and experienced the different systems and tutoring systems currently available related to mathematics. And uh, by the end, when we went to Asyut, we used the Khan Academy as a way of testing to test what uh, the teachers want and what the students want. And the regular way of uh, the videos uh, without animation or just showing videos to the students was not appealing at all to the students or the teachers and uh, was considered very complicated to them um, and not appealing. So uh, this is why the teachers asked for interactive content and uh, for content uh, with the visuals um, that, uh, that's attractive for the students. So here, uh, we decided to use generative AI, the power of generative AI to generate a lesson uh, for the teachers. So you see here in the left side of the screen that uh, the teachers can uh, enter to our tutoring system and choose if they would like to generate a lesson or 
enter the text of the uh, video themselves. Then, just a second. Then, as you see here, uh, in the left side of the screen, there is a part of a script uh, explaining a fraction uh, to the students. And this part of the script is uh, with the generative, uh, the, with the power of generative AI, is translated to uh, a snippet of video or a, a short video showing something uh, to what it got explained. So, uh, for example, here uh, to explain fraction to students, we were uh, talking about uh, how fraction is like uh, dividing um, the concept of fraction and dividing a cake for eight slices. And um, one over eight means that you are taking one of those eight slices. And in the right side of the screen, you can see that how uh, with the power of artificial intelligence, how this part is translated to a video showing this part, like uh, the a cake uh, sliced and a part of this cake. Uh, here, as you see, the teacher has control over the content. So either if the uh, AI generated the script or the, the teacher is the one who entered the script, in both cases, the teacher has the power to choose uh, what the parts of the text are uh, transformed into videos or uh, into visuals. Uh, the AI will suggest the text that it will trans be transformed to uh, to videos, but still the teacher has the power either to remove a certain text from the video, or remove up this part of the script, or uh, to leave it as it is, or to add something to the script. Also, uh, Generative AI can help uh, in uh, generating, after entering the script and forming the videos, can help in uh, generating a pool of questions which the teachers can freely use with their students for practice. So this is the part, uh, the content uh, block. And then the second block is having a learning management system in which the, uh, the teachers can interact with the students. And uh, you can see here, we decided um, to use Udo uh, as a learning management system. First, Udo is an open source learning management system and has a lot of features which combine, um, which help you to generate generative AI uh, content. This, this is a part. And uh, also uh, it has an explainable dashboard. So this is why we uh, this, uh, wanted to use Udo or recommended to use Udo as a learning management system. So the teachers can integrate uh, seamlessly the videos and the questions uh, generated the, in the first block and uh, start putting that in uh, inside the learning management system. Um, um, and as I am saying, the learning management system here is acting as the interface and uh, between the content generated by the teachers and the students and uh, to help us collect data about uh, the performance of the students um, uh, with, the, with the questions, with the content and so on. Then the third block is in which we are going to use uh, a specialized application in Udo, which is the Udo dashboard. Uh, the dashboard uh, uses also uh, generative AI to uh, create explainable and visualized reports for each student. So uh, this is briefly uh, the proposed solution that we came up with after uh, visiting the community schools, talking with teachers, with the students, measuring the students' performance, and uh, looking for what teachers are expecting from uh, artificial intelligence or from uh, smart uh, tutoring systems. Thank you. Thank you so much for that, Marwa. Uh, that, that was an incredible presentation. I just have a quick question. Um, how does this system work uh, for for Arabic? Does it do, do they input in Arabic? Uh, the language, uh, we didn't want to focus uh, to have the power of the system in the language because we wanted it to be used in any other language. Mm -hmm. So uh, generative, uh, here, here is the power that uh, the script could be transformed into uh, Arabic language or uh, you can write the captions or coming to the 
in the in the video uh, using uh, the Arabic language. The other thing that teachers wanted and the uh, they they uh, uh, they stressed about is they wanted to put their video their voice over the videos. So mm -hmm. this is something important and was a very important note. They mentioned, and it was obvious and clear inside the classroom, how the students are used to the teacher's voice. And uh, when they listen to their teachers, they get uh, um, they, they reach a certain level of attention. So uh, the teachers proposed uh, that they need uh, interactive videos in which they put their voices over those videos. So this is something we want to have in this torturing system, that the AI helps them create the snippets, the videos, the, the, that interactive video, and the teacher can add her voice in the Arabic language or in any other language uh, over those videos. So uh, the, by the end, the students will listen to her explaining in uh, the Arabic language. Uh, this is something requested by the teachers and they, they stress that they want to do, to have this option of adding their voices. <clears throat> okay, thank you so much for that. Um, and thank you for the presentation. Uh, I'd like to move on to uh, Ecuador and analyzing public procurement anomalies in Ecuador with the gender perspective presented uh, in Spanish by Susana Cadena and Sofia Aleman. Uh, Susana Cadena is a professor at the Universidad Central de Ecuador and the co-founder of da the Datalat Foundation a doctor in computer science with a specialty in data quality, open data, and AI. Um, I believe we have Sophia with us as well. Uh, therefore, um, you can switch again to the English language channel. If you haven't switched already, uh, the presentation will be made in Spanish and we'll have translation. Thank you so much and welcome, Sophia. Sí, buen día. Antes que nada, me gustaría ofrecer una disculpa porque Susi eh, no está disponible en este momento, tuvo un problema, así que voy a realizar la presentación de, de este proyecto yo. Eh, procedo a compartir la pantalla. ¿Me confirman si ahí ya se ve? Sí. Sí, sí. <ríe> listo. Muchas gracias, Michelle. Entonces, en nuestro proyecto ha sido un modelo de inteligencia artificial basado en detección de anomalías para determinar alertas tempranas en contratación pública, pero incluyendo la perspectiva de género. Nuestro objetivo es diseñar una metodología que eh, nos permita generar estas alertas tempranas que mencionaba eh, para detectar anomalías en distintos procesos de contratación pública. Como se sabe, la contratación pública es un tema muy, muy amplio y en donde participan muchas personas. Sin embargo, todavía no existe la perspectiva de género y es una realidad que vivimos aquí en Ecuador. Y de ahí es lo que surge este proyecto. Entonces, lo que queremos es utilizar un modelo de inteligencia artificial que mejore la eficiencia de este gasto. Y también eh, queremos evaluar cómo es esta adjudicación de obras, porque hay presupuestos muy, muy grandes y detectamos que hay un problema en la repartición de este, de este presupuesto. Respecto a eso, la primera acción que tomamos fue una reunión de acercamiento con el sector de la economía popular y solidaria. ¿Por qué escogimos este sector? Porque es un sector bastante vulnerable y ahí hay bastantes mujeres que, por ejemplo, se dedican en negocios como coser, como tejer, eh, como servicios de alimentación y no siempre es bien recompensado. Además, eh, también tenemos el otro factor que son gente que no ha culminado su educación formal. Nos comentaban que la mayor eh, parte de la población que se dedica a esto tal vez tiene educación eh, del nivel primario o a veces ni siquiera ha concluido el nivel primario. Entonces son muy susceptibles de eh, caer en estas, en estas desigualdades de, del sistema en general. Para eso eh, tuvimos varios encuentros. Uno fue de forma presencial en la ciudad de Quito, que es donde nosotros vivimos. Pero también fuimos a un territorio un poco más rural, que es la provincia de Cotopaxi. Y también hicimos reuniones de forma virtual para poder abarcar más parte del territorio, porque es algo que se da a nivel nacional. En la primera tuvimos a, a los participantes que pueden ver en mi pantalla, donde hicimos una reunión híbrida y conversamos con ellos. 
Para conversar se, se hizo una metodología con, el ayuda, con la asesoría de una experta en género y también tuvimos asesoría de eh, la dirección de la Cámara de Economía Popular y Solidaria. Se formó un espacio de discusión. Todo, todos estos talleres tuvieron le, la misma metodología y fueron de forma general muy similares, que tenían cuatro fases. En la primera se hizo una pequeña introducción como para contextualizar y comentarles también qué es lo que nosotros queremos eh, que nos cuenten y para darles confianza y que ellos puedan participar libremente. La segunda fase ya fuimos directamente con las preguntas acerca de lo que, lo que queríamos saber, lo que queríamos que nos cuenten desde su perspectiva. Y es, ese ejercicio fue muy importante y eh, posteriormente ya les voy a comentar cuál fue el resultado que obtuvimos. ¿Ya? Eh, se los preguntó en varias etapas, o sea, en, en, desde, varios, eh, desde varios enfoques. Es individualmente, asociación, porque a veces pueden postular como consorcios. Entonces es importante tomar este enfoque también y como empresas. Eh, en la tercera parte seguimos con las preguntas, pero ahí ya se abrió un poco más. Y también es importante eh, notar que tuvimos no solo gente eh, que participaba en compras públicas, sino también funcionarios que son quienes eh, generan los procesos y necesitan contratar a, a personas eh, a través del sistema de contratación pública. Entonces se formó una discusión bastante interesante teniendo estos dos puntos de vista. Y finalmente en la fase 4 se realizó una conclusión en general donde conversamos y alguien nos contaba la conclusión de todo lo que, lo que vimos antes. ¿Cuáles fueron las preguntas? O sea, ¿En qué fue lo que nos enfocamos para determinar estas, las conclusiones finales? En primera instancia, preguntamos sobre los factores que influyen en los procesos de contratación pública. Esto es parte relacionado con el proceso que se realiza para poder postular a un proceso de, de contratación pública. Tenemos la parte de, por ejemplo, presentación de ofertas que nos comentaron que se les complicaba bastante porque hay muchísimos formatos, trámites, hay mucha información que no siempre está al alcance de, de la ciudadanía, de las personas que van a publicar. Sobre el proceso también, que son distintas fases, este es un proceso muy técnico donde hay muchísimo, muchísimas aristas que, que resolver y que ir viendo fase a fase. Y finalmente los resultados. Eso también es algo que nos comentaron que no les quedaba claro. Y a veces en, no pasaban a la siguiente etapa y no, no conocían por qué, no sabían cómo apelar o, o cómo conocer el motivo por el que no pasaron. Por otro lado, también eh, preguntamos sobre la participación, sobre el enfoque de género en sí. Sobre cómo es la participación de hombres y mujeres en este sistema de compras públicas. Y ahí también tuvimos unos hallazgos muy interesantes porque conversamos con la entidad que es quien lleva estos procesos aquí en Ecuador, que se llama CERCO. La entidad en sí no, no tiene esta variable de género. No tenemos como parte del sistema el recopilar la variable de género al momento de, de realizar un proceso. Entonces se complicaba bastante, pero fue un hallazgo muy interesante en este punto del taller. La siguiente parte que, que preguntamos fue sobre las acciones afirmativas para garantizar la participación interseccional en estos procesos. Y en base a esta pregunta determinamos dos, dos tipos de procesos en los que nos vamos a centrar, justamente porque tienen este componente de acciones afirmativas, y son el catálogo inclusivo y la feria inclusiva. Estos dos tienen cierto componente eh, de puntaje para favorecer la participación de estas, pequeñas, de estas pequeñas asociaciones de la economía popular y solidaria y también de género. También puntuaban porque eh, quien lidere sea una mujer. Eh, posteriormente fuimos un poco más al lado de los reglamentos y en esta parte nos comentaban que no están muy familiarizados porque leer un documento a nivel de leyes, de reglamentos, Resulta complicado para un ciudadano que no tiene la, la especialización de leyes o abogacía. Entonces, eh, todas estas preguntas nos llevaron a, a la conclusión de lo que se necesita. El primer paso que nos comentaron que necesitaban urgentemente era algo que les ayude 
a, a resolver estas partes del proceso, a entender, a saber cómo hacer. Porque actualmente, ¿qué pasaba? Lo que sucedía era que ellos tenían que pagar. Entonces, aparte que son organizaciones muy pequeñas, que no tienen ganancias tan grandes, tenían que pagar parte de sus ganancias para que les orienten en estos procesos. Y es algo bastante complicado. Y conversando con ellos, surgió la idea de realizar un chatbot. Y esa es la primera, la primera conclusión y la primera etapa de este proyecto, basado en la necesidad que surgió en los talleres realizados. Bueno, adicionalmente de los talleres realizamos el procesamiento porque fue, fue una conversación y tenemos los audios, se los transcribió y realizamos una nube de palabras. Entre todo, eh, lo que más se habló fue del proceso, pero aquí nos llamó la atención tener la palabra bueno, que ya nos da una idea como positiva de, de lo que la gente piensa sobre este proceso. Hicimos eh, este tratamiento de la información con todos los encuentros que tuvimos y tenemos todas las nubes de palabras y de ahí nos pusimos a armar lo que es ya la arquitectura de la solución. La arquitectura de, en forma general de esta solución es la que pueden ver en este momento en mi pantalla. Tenemos dos componentes principales, que el uno sería la, la aplicación de alertas, que es para detectar las anomalías. Y la segunda parte sería el chat, que es lo que salió en base a los talleres. En cuanto a la aplicación de alerta, como aquí en Ecuador tenemos un portal de eh, compras públicas, OCDS, podemos consumir directamente desde una API. Entonces, eh, al lado izquierdo podemos ver que todo el flujo iniciaría desde este consumo de la API y lo pasaríamos a través de un modelo eh, y este modelo lo que haría era deter determinar cuando tengamos una anomalía. ¿Y ahí por qué hablamos de anomalías? Porque hay cosas que eh, pueden ser detectadas y están fuera de, del alcance o fuera de los reglamentos y ya nos da un indicio de que puede haber algo raro ahí. No podemos llamarlo directamente como algo negativo o como corrupción, pero si hay algo, una anomalía, ya debemos tener una alerta para ver qué, qué se puede hacer en ese caso. Este sistema está pensado para correr en, en segundo plano y como digo, directamente consumiendo los datos del portal. La otra parte eh, y la primera y lo que constituye la primera etapa es el chatbot. El chatbot sería en lenguaje natural de ayuda en estos procesos y contendría eh, formularios, páginas guías, enlaces a los tutoriales, que mucha de esta información existe, pero no es accesible. Eso sería un modelo de texto generativo en lenguaje natural y tendríamos una base de datos almacenada en un servicio de la nube. Por supuesto que esto tendría una interfaz muy eh, amigable en una primera etapa dentro de un portal web incrustado como un chatbot, pero también eh, dejando la posibilidad de que se constituya en una aplicación móvil, que es algo que ellos manejan muy bien y que nos contaron que les agiliza bastante el trabajo. Posteriormente eh, definimos la, la arquitectura para la primera etapa y es lo que se puede ver en este momento. Nosotros trabajamos con la infraestructura de, de AWS y tendríamos una parte, eh, aquí en la parte superior, un logueo por seguridad. Aunque no es información sensible lo que vamos a manejar, porque todo es dato abierto, necesitamos eh, cuidar la, la seguridad de la aplicación. Lo que tendríamos es un chatbot y hay dos, dos componentes principales que eh, son los que manejaríamos para el modelo en sí. El primero en la parte de arriba es lo que nos permitiría leer los PDFs, porque gran parte de la información que tenemos son leyes, son reglamentos, eh, está escrito en un documento, pero a veces son demasiado largos y demasiado complicados. Entonces, en esa parte de aquí haríamos esa búsqueda directamente en los PDFs. Pero si no, ¿qué pasa si es que no están en los PDFs? Pasaríamos al modelo generativo con una base de preguntas y respuestas, porque tampoco está toda la información en, en esos PDFs. Entonces, eh, tendríamos un modelo corriendo que tenga toda esta información. El por qué optamos por este tipo de modelos y no fuimos directamente a nos, nosotros a desarrollar un solo modelo complejo es por la variabilidad. 
que nos dimos cuenta también que eh, las leyes cambian. Entonces siempre eh, lo más óptimo va a ser eh, tener un lugar donde podamos cambiar. Y sí, en conclusión, eh, los procesos de compras públicas en Ecuador deberían incluir la perspectiva de género. Y el primer paso es algo ciudadano que eh, ayude a las personas más vulnerables a participar de forma igualitaria en este proceso. Gracias. Thank you so much, Sofia. That was an incredible presentation. Um, I'm mindful of time, so I will move to uh, our next presentation. So next up, this is our final presentation before the panel session. We move to Chile and Feminist NLP, an annotated corpus to evaluate sex differences in work-related diseases in Chile, presented by Jocelyn Dutton Escudero, an assistant professor at the Catholic University of Chile. Jocelyn holds a PhD in applied mathematics from the University of Cambridge and a postdoc in public health from Johns Hopkins University. The current work focuses in using natural language processing to leverage critical information that supports decision making. This project is about analyzing the description of work-related accidents with a gender perspective. So Jocelyn, um, I will leave it to you. Thanks very much. So in the in the in the screen uh, or uh, slides uh, is the people that applied to this project that came from Argentina and Chile, and we also count with the the work of undergrads that is Valentina Rocio and Cabo. So first of all, what was the idea behind this uh, um, application? That there is evidence that suggests that there are gender differences in work related accidents. The safety, the Chilean Safety Association, ACH has 51% of the workers and we, we have a collaboration with them. Uh, we are we realized that in the free text, in the description of the accident, we could identify the mechanism. This is for example, false or posterior overload. And our final goal was to, I mean, and that's why the title of the of the of the project was to have an annotated corpus, means from the description of the accident that someone like a human with knowledge on this topic could like mark or or highlight what was the mechanism. And those mechanism comes from the OIT, La Organización Internacional del Trabajo, or the Labor uh, International Organization. So since we didn't have much time during these six months, we used ChatGPT, the API, not the, the free one. Uh, and that, those are the results I'm going to show you. So first of all, I would like to highlight some challenges. As always in, in these artificial intelligence projects, uh, data agreements take a lot of time. In our case, a couple of months since we have uh, we have full access to the data. Also recruiting uh, people was complex. I mean, due to like the, the budget constraints and also that it was a very short project. At the end, we had help of these undergrad students, but in my case, as a professor in the university, I had to uh, wait to advertise a research internship. So also that was complex. Um, we also realized that occupations were written in free text. So at the beginning, we thought that our challenge was to identify the mechanism of the accident, but we end up using a lot of our time just trying to understand if driver, driver of a taxi, driver of the taxi that belongs to the municipality, whatever, like, they write really different the, the occupations. And when you want to show results that are grouped by occupation, that was that was actually very difficult. And also I found that it was very difficult, the work overload of the whole team uh, to make a proper advancement of the project. So in terms of results, in occupations, that thing that I told you that was very hard, uh, in, in purple, we have the, for the females in the data set, cleaning personnel uh, has most of the, of the data set, but also machine and plan operation and teachers, while for men is machine and plan operators, the, the first one, but then manufacturing at uh, industries and protection guards. In terms of uh, occupations that are related to care, or I mean, taking care of others, we find that as we all know here in this room, uh, females uh, take most of, the, of those occupations. And finally about mechanism, 
we found that females fall a lot more uh, than men. And I mean, I know that it doesn't show that much in the plot, but actually the from the data set, 60% of the accidents are males and 40% are females around that numbers. But then when we look specifically at falling from the same level, there are more females. So there is a, like proportionally a lot more females falling uh, from the same level. And then we have the posterior overload and the contact uh, with sharp materials as a third. So I have to repeat, those mechanisms, those ad identification of the mechanism were obtained uh, using ChatGPT. So in terms of other activities that we did during the six months, uh, we went to Buenos Aires for the uh, for the uh, Data Feminist translation, the release of the translation in Spanish. And that was a very nice, and this in the photo, you can see uh, me and Daniela Moyano, the other professor from Chile and the authors of the book and the translation. We also um, had um, a book club on this book and we did it both um, online and in person. And when we did it in person, we used part of the funding for having like a coffee break. Uh, this is the, um, the, the, the one online. And actually we have in the first session more than 50 people connected and we were highlighted by the Ministry of Science in Chile. So in terms of future work, we would like to uh, connect with the Chilean uh, International Labor Organization officer. There is one officer and we would like to show our results and uh, we would like to secure funding to do the corpus annotation in order to have a, a, a proper a gold standard to compare the chat GPT or any model that will do this automatization. Uh, I would like to offer, also offer a master, a PhD thesis on the automatic detection and coding of mechanism and occupations from free text. And um, we would like to work further on the data visualization since we have on in the team Daniela Moyano that is a professor in design. And finally, we would like to make sure that our results uh, get attended to, in particular, for example, the things of falling. Like maybe, maybe the, the authorities don't know that women fall so much and they and they actually arrive in the, uh, to um, occupational health for that reason. Thanks very much. Thank you so much, Jocelyn. Um, I'm really curious about um, what the, if there's any reasoning or what you think uh, was causing uh, the women to have more falls and um, if that might have had to do with their personal protective equipment or or what what's the thinking behind that? Yeah, we we what we didn't have because of the data that we we actually had was the age of people. So so when when I I mentioned that to to another person, she uh, she was saying, but maybe it's because like in in cleaning positions there are many women uh, at old age. So and maybe they have they don't have the muscular anatomy a correct one to do that hard work and that's why they are falling so much so i think that that's part of the future work try to also navigate how the data and like the the occupation the accident and the age uh, they the three agree on, on that Thank you so much. Um, and now I'll just move swiftly into our Baja panel session. So I'll invite all of our panelists um, in one minute or less. Uh, I'm very curious to hear from each person. Um, what was the biggest and most surprising insight that emerged from the research for you? So we can go in, I'm looking at my screen, we can go in order. I'll start with Jaime Wan. Or, or Jocelyn, if, if you're all right with it. Sorry. Oh, it's okay. Sorry. Hey, uh, can you repeat again, uh, Kondil? I just uh, bit yeah, lost sure. uh, the connection. All right. Uh, what was the biggest and most surprising insight that emerged from the research for, for you? From the whole research from our participants? Mm-hmm. Yeah. So... Uh, what what surprised me, or best not least surprised me, is because uh, I read uh, a couple of papers from previous cohort that uh, we share a lot of similarities actually, 
in term of uh, the challenges and also uh, possible approaches. Uh, for example, I recognize that the technical approach that we use uh, also has similarities at least in two or three other presentations, which probably can uh, trigger further collaboration uh, between uh, a research project. All right, fantastic. Thank you so much for that. Um, I'll move to Jocelyn. Yeah, I think that we didn't realize at the beginning how difficult it was, the, the data set. And that's often, like sometimes you, when you go to meetings, you concentrate in a problem, for example, the detection of mechanisms and agents of accident. And then when the data set arrived, then we realized how, they, how, how, how much the free text was everywhere in the data set. And yeah, and sometimes it's hard because for the people, for your counterparts, sometimes it's not a problem or like they don't see that what you have to do that is leverage information like statistics. And um, sometimes they don't see where can be the challenge. And I think that that's what I, I will like have uh, understand from the beginning. Um, That's really interesting. Thank you so much for that. Um, <clears throat> uh, Next, uh, I'll go to Padmini. Yeah, thanks. Um, so I think for us, uh, I think there are two big surprises. One was just the readiness with which um, GBV is being kind of catered to using AI, because it seems that we're not at a point where uh, we can kind of confidently use these technologies to prevent uh, re-traumatizing of uh, victims. And so, you know, it's, uh, it's kind of a little worrying that there's a, a push towards using AI so widely in the online gender-based violence space. Uh, and I think the second thing is that um, there hasn't been, and I think this is because we're in India, there's really very, very limited data sets um, in terms of uh, understanding how gender-based violence is spoken about in Indian languages. Uh, so for things like NLP, for example, Indian languages are really uh, low resourced. Even Hindi, which is the most spoken language in the country, is 0.1% of the internet. So uh, it doesn't really help in terms of uh, creating NLP and AI solutions. So it means that in order for us to build anything meaningful, we first need to uh, kind of cross that barrier. Thank you so much. Um, I think that's a really insightful response. Uh, I'll call up uh, Sophia. Claro. Eh, para nosotros un hallazgo súper importante fue eh, evidenciar la diferencia entre lo que pasa en la ciudad capital con la ruralidad. Fuimos a hacer un taller y tuvimos resultados muy diferentes. Y de seguro si vamos tal vez a algún lugar un poco más alejado eh, va a ser aún peor la situación. Eso y por otro lado, el darnos cuenta de cómo surgen las necesidades ciudadanas que a veces van por un poco al lado de lo que nosotros pensamos. O sea, siempre pensar en lo que la gente pide y lo que le puede solucionar. Porque nuestra solución original puede hacer cambios, pero tal vez un poco más a largo plazo. Y el chatbot que nos contaban es algo un poco más inmediato que les va a beneficiar de forma rápida. Thank you so much. Uh, lastly, I will ask Marwa. Uh, I'm not sure if Marwa is still with us, uh, but if not, I just wanted to say thank you so much to all of our presenters and thank you to everybody who attended. Uh, we are so excited to see how this series has been progressing and we're very excited to welcome you back next month uh, for yet another one of this global webinar series. Uh, we wish you a good morning, good evening, good night, uh, wherever it is that you are in the world. And thank you so much for joining and thank you to our translator.